Welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. Uh, I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and on tonight's Dharma Doors, our kind of Dharma study, um, the theme tonight or the topic that I want to kind of focus on tonight is the idea of awakening, otherwise known as bodhi, bodhi. Um, I'm going to talk about the difference between enlightenment and awakening, but that's also kind of within tonight's topic. So um, the reading that I have prepared, if we get there, I'm in no rush to get there, but if we get to the reading, it's a reading that's going to be very, very much about the nature of bodhi, and this idea of awakening. And so I thought tonight I would sort of split sort of split the evening into two parts. A first part where we just sort of talk about the idea of awakening, sort of what it is or what it might be, um, just some kind of general remarks and ideas about this. And then we'll transition into a kind of a deeper dharmic study from the text um, and look to that for some wisdom. So. Um, so the word, again, the word that we're going to be focusing on tonight is this word bodhi. And actually, I was just thinking about this moments ago before class started. And, you know, this word bodhi, as I often point out pretty all the time, the root of this word bodhi is bud, be what in English would be B-U-D, bud. And of course, this Sanskrit root word bud is where we get the English word bud from, like a flower bud. And that's because the word bud means to awaken, to open up like a flower. And of course, that root word bud, which becomes bodhi, the very idea of awakening, but that bud is, of course, the root of buddha, buddha. And I was thinking about it earlier. We call, we call this tradition Buddhism. And if we know that the word bud means awakening, then this tradition could just as easily be called awakeningism. That's sort of a tongue twister there, so I'm glad we don't do that. But my point is, is that insofar as this is called Buddhism, it is a tradition or a practice that's about Bodhi, that's about awakening. And if that's, you know, if this idea is so central to the tradition, let's spend some time talking about it. Now, this is, of course, part of a longer series of talks I've been giving on Sunday nights now. That's about the bodhisattva. And that, of course, is a being, a sattva of awakening. <laughs> not a, not a, a sattva, not a being of flesh, blood, and bone, not a being of the air, not a sattva of the water, but a sattva of bodhi, a bodhisattva. And as I defined it many, many, many Sundays ago, you could think of the bodhisattva as one who is headed towards buddha, to the state of being an awakened one. And the sutra that we've been reading for a while now, and these series of talks that I've been giving for a while now, they've all been focused on this sort of bodhisattva path. And the text we've been reading has been about the practices of a bodhisattva, sort of what they do, what they practice, what they cultivate. We've even gotten even deeper into the idea of making vows, doing all kinds of interesting practices as bodhisattvas. And it's all been for awakening. That's the idea. 
So I, tonight we're going to talk about what that awakening could possibly be. And the thing about it is, is this, this, I, the reason why I really would like to get to the reading tonight is the reading really articulates what awakening is, what Bodhi is. But there's a few ideas that I kind of want to prepare you for before I read it. And so that's where I just kind of want to talk about awakening. So, of course, how one defines this idea will really determine or speak to the kind of Buddhist one is. Meaning if different kinds of Buddhists and different kinds of Buddhisms have slightly and sometimes not so slightly different understandings of what awakening is. So I'm going to share with you what my understanding of the word is, what my understanding of the experience is, and all of that in, in some pretty simple terms. I'm not going to get really esoteric or anything. Um, but just to put it my way, and again, so very making this very clear, this is just my own uh, understanding of it in that sense. Um, well, the first thing, actually, let me kind of get this out of the way. In English, we often use two terms interchangeably, enlightenment and awakening. Awakening actually isn't as common as enlightenment, even though the two, those two words, enlightenment and awakening, are seemingly pointing towards the same idea. There is a kind of a word or kind of an idea in Buddhist Sanskrit that does have to do with light and sort of illumination. In fact, that's probably the better way to, in, to translate the word or the idea is illumination. And we will, we, you might have heard about or, yeah, you might have heard about the idea of the illuminated mind. That is sort of more with working within the metaphor of light and enlightening in that sense. But whether we're talking about illumination, <laughs> enlightenment, or awakening, again, I think they're all pointing, and they are used interchangeably, by the way. This isn't my opinion, but they, these words are used interchangeably to point at the same idea, which is awakening <laughs> is this idea of like the goal, if you want to put it that way. Um, so I'm going to stick with the awakening, the bodhi, the bud, that idea. Um, but I just want everybody to know that I am also talking about what it, what it means to be enlightened, or again, how I understand that idea. Um, so really quickly, again, this is just to put the, the sutra in context tonight. My understanding of awakening as most of you probably already know i am very partial to understanding buddhism through you uh kind of through working with dream states using dream states either literally meaning a kind of dream yoga or as an analogy or a metaphor so Everybody knows I'm always talking about this idea of imagining you're in a dream and then working with various metaphors or various ideas within the dreamscape or within the dream state. And, you know, the basic idea, at, you know, let's just put this really simply, just lay out some basic ideas. If we understand the basics of the Dharma, the basics of the teachings of the Buddha, then we'll understand that one of the simplest, most important teachings is what is called the three poisons or the three afflictions, the three kleshas. And these are normally listed as greed, anger, and delusion. I prefer attraction, aversion, and confusion for raga, dvesha, and moha. Those are the three poisons. 
And just to sort of, again, use the dream analogy as, a, as, a, as an example, the idea, of course, is that if we were in a dream and we saw something that attracted us, whether it was someone who we were attracted to or something we were attracted to, or even if it was some idea that we were attracted to, like, I don't know, you know, there's a mountain in my dream and I'm attracted to the idea of climbing to the top of it. So that's my attraction in that sense. Or again, maybe it's somebody or something that I want to have or own. Likewise, there could be something in a dream that I'm averse to that makes me angry. Again, it could be someone that makes me angry or something that makes me angry or a kind of, um, you know, you know, those dreams where you're trying to run and you can't. It's so frustrating, right? And the idea is, is that you would like to be moving faster or further away and it's frustrating when you can't. So that's a kind of aversion or a kind of anger in that sense. Now, both of those, the idea of being attracted to something in a dream or the idea of a being averse to something in a dream, upon waking in the morning, we realize we, oh, my wanting that thing was, was futile. It, it, there wasn't that thing for me to actually uh, to actually get. And by the way, let me just put this in a much more clearer context. Let's imagine you needed some money for some reason, pay your rent, pay some bills or what have you. Now you go to sleep and you're in a dream and there's a big envelope of money across on the other side of the room. What I'm talking about is the mind in that dream state that doesn't know it's dreaming and actually thinks, oh, if, I could get, if I could get that envelope of that money, I could pay my rent, I could pay my bills. But of course, when we wake up, we realize that even had I attained that envelope of money, it was dream money. It wasn't real. So my wanting it, meaning I wanted it because I knew that it could solve all my problems. When we wake up, we realize, oh, it wasn't real money that, he, again, I couldn't, my landlord wouldn't have accepted the dream money is what I'm getting at, right? So my, my desiring of it, my wanting of it, my craving of it was totally for naught. There was nothing there, but nonetheless, there was this desire, even though it wasn't a real envelope of money. Now, again, let's say my landlord is a, not a very nice person and I encounter them in that dream. Encountering this mean landlord that wants all my money is going to then possibly create aversion. So now I am angry and averse at my dream landlord and I'm trying to get this dream money. And of course, when I wake up from both from the dream, I realize neither of those were real in that sense. But my desire was real in that it was an experience I was having at the time. And my aversion was real in that I was having it at the time. Now, there's one more piece of the puzzle. And that piece of the puzzle is that feeling one has when one is in a dream, the feeling that one has that one exists. And what I mean by that is the feeling that one is in a world with envelopes of money and other people like my landlord, and there's me. So there's the envelope, there's my landlord, and there's me. And that is in a dream, in my dream analogy, that is the third klesha, 
the confusion or delusion about the nature of the self. And you can get a real taste of that confusion when you're in a dream. And what I mean by that is, is that you think you're in a body. You think you're in a world of objects and things that are attainable and all of that. And those ideas that there's objects out there to be grabbed or to be had is creating the sense that there's a, a me here to do the grabbing. And of course, when we wake up in the morning, we realize, oh, that wasn't me, meaning that wasn't my body, that wasn't my world, that, was, you know, that wasn't really my landlord. Now, the confusion, of course, continues <laughs> even when we are awakened in the morning, which is that we still want stuff, <laughs> we still are averse to stuff, and we're still confused about the nature of the self, particularly this idea that we have that we are between the ears and behind the eyes. Isn't that the exact same idea that we have in a dream? That we are back, back there somewhere experiencing a world. So my point is, is that those are the three kleshas. Those are the way they would operate in a dream. But the idea is, is that they are operating here in this realm of reality, and we are still poisoned by these things in that way. Okay, so that's the three poisons. That's the confusion, the attraction, and the aversion. And I kind of wanted to point out at how they are reinforcing each other in that way, where because I think there's something out there to be had, there must be somebody here that could have it, right? And so that creates a little feedback loop. So what I want to, this has all been to get to my point. It can so happen that when one is in a dream, that one thinks is reality and thinks there's things to get and thinks there's things to be averse to and thinks there's a self there to be having and being averse, it could so happen that we become lucidly aware that we are dreaming. This is, of course, what is called a lucid dream. And a lucid dream, I really hope you've had one because it's a really great thing to refer to in terms of Bodhi, in terms of awakening. But the idea is, is that when we become lucidly aware that we are dreaming. Something very profound happens. And what happens is, is that we wake up, but we're still in the dream world, but we are awake. And what it means to be awake in a dream, what it means to be lucid is that you are aware that it's a dream. You are aware that even though it looks like there's a big envelope of money out there, there's not a real envelope of money out there. Even though this looks like my landlord, I know it's not my landlord. Like, I know it. I know I'm in this dream right now. That's a lucid dream. And of course, that lucidity also reveals that one is not in the dream. One is having a dream, but one is not actually in the dream because that would be being in a world. Now, the thing about it is, is that that moment of lucidity where one becomes aware that it's a dream, aware that it's not real money, aware that it's not a real landlord, and aware that it's not a real Michael or a real me, 
even though there's that breakthrough of lucidity, it may actually not stop the desire, especially if it's not a big thing of money, but it's a physical body that we are interested in touching, let's say. So just because we're aware that it's dream doesn't mean those desires are total are going to go away necessarily. The aversion might not go away necessarily. And from my experience of exploring lucid dream states, the persistence of feeling as if you're on the receiving end also remains, even though you're aware, and this is the particular litmus test for this, when we're in a dream, but we're not lucid, meaning we're we think it's just another day in our life. When we're in that state, we are very protective of our dream bodies. By which I mean, if somebody were coming at me, you know, to harm me, I would recoil because I think there's a body there to be defended. Or, you know, if I were driving a car and whoop, went off the cliff, I would be terrified that I was about to die. But if I became lucidly aware, I would be able to, in a way, accept that uh, the, the car falling off the cliff because I would be able to say, oh, it's not my body, not a real car, not a real event. I'm going to wake up in a second. So I want to really point that out about the nature of the self, which is that it, a lot of it is about defending the body in that way, fear of death, fear of dying. All of that is wrapped up in that sense of self. And I want to point out how in a lucid dream state, we kind of get on top of that a little bit, we get on top of fear a little bit, get on top of desire, get on top of aversion. But again, we might not totally obviously um, automatically get over the three poisons just because we have a lucid dream or just because we have a lucid moment. So <clears throat> that idea of a lucid dream where you become aware, well, the way that I understand Buddhism and the way that I understand the Dharma and the practice is that my understanding is that there is a similar process of becoming lucid here in this realm, meaning we're still kind of asleep and there is a way, there are processes and techniques for actually waking up further, waking up more than we are already awake. And the only way that I can have found to describe that experience is that it's like a lucid dream, but as it pertains to reality or what we think is reality. And so there is a, that same kind of awakening, like in a lucid dream where we thought we were awake, but there's actually further wakening to happen. Now, I want to make it really clear, and I've been saying this to a lot of folks lately, when Buddhism, when the Buddha, when this tradition says that this, that what's happening right now, that you watching this or you listening to this, when they say that this is dream-like, they mean it's dream-like, not that it's a dream. Buddhism isn't saying that this is a dream. As far as I understand it, Buddhism is saying that this is dream-like. It's like that. But don't get confused and think, well, let me put it to you this way. Don't start thinking that you are really somewhere else and you're having this dream called your life or reality. The Dharma, my understanding of the Dharma, is that there's no 
where else to be but here. But how we are relating to this is what matters. So let me go back to my dream analogy for a second. I, again, I hope you've had a lucid dream so that you can kind of really follow along with this. It's always, I've, I've learned it's difficult if one hasn't had a lucid dream. I've learned it's difficult to make the connection here. But if you've had a lucid dream or if you know, you know what we're really talking about in that way, I want to remind you that it began where it was just another day in our life. And there was a big envelope of money and there was my landlord and there was me. But then by some miracle, I became lucidly aware that I was in a dream and I realized, ah, that's not a real uh, envelope of money. It's a total manifestation of my desire, right? Which is that I, you know, I went to sleep thinking I really needed money and lo and behold, I have a dream about a big envelope of money. Right. So that's where the big envelope of money comes from. And when I become lucidly aware, I realize, oh, that's not a real thing of money. That's not a real landlord. And this isn't, isn't even really my body in that way. But if you've had a lucid dream, here's what's the most important thing about it. When we become lucid, nothing changes except the emotional disposition towards what's happening. Now, of course, if you're a, a uh, skilled lucid dreamer, you can, of course, begin to change and alter your surroundings. And of course, you can fly and you can do all of these things. But my point is, is that if there was the big thing of big envelope of money and there was the landlord and there was the me, when I become lucidly aware, it still looks like there's a thing of money over there. And it still looks like there's a guy called, who's my landlord over there. And it still sure feels like there's a me here. But what has radically ch changed, what has shifted 180 degrees is my emotional disposition towards it all, which is that I am now aware that my desire is futile. I'm aware that my aversion is futile, meaning I could, get as, I could get angry at this person that I think is my landlord, but I now realize it's not really my landlord. So if I want to be angry, I have to accept that I'm just sitting here being angry in that way. And then, as I already mentioned, there's the persistence of the subject object relationship that continues in a dream. So again, the dynamics, the, the, the dynamics, the subject object situation, the dynamics of a dream sort of remain the same if I become lucid, but what changes again is the way I feel about it. That is what I want to, to take from this analogy of a lucid dream. That's what I want to take to this world, this realm, and what I'm talking about or what I'm thinking about in terms of awakening, meaning bodhi. When seemingly, when one becomes awakened, not much really changes except the radical shifting of emotionality in terms of, well, what it leads to, again, it doesn't happen automatically, but what it leads to is what they talk about as fearlessness, the idea of not having desire, not having aversion, and no longer being deluded or confused about the nature of the self. So now let's get a little bit, unless there's any ideas or comments or ideas that have come up from the dream analogy, pretty straightforward. You've heard it from me a million times. So now let's take that analogy a little further. So the reason why I wanted to set this up the way I did, which was that you could have this kind of um, satori, as the Japanese would call it, a kind of 
a breakthrough moment where you become aware, like in the lucid dream, where you become aware that you're dreaming, in, especially in the Zen, the Japanese Zen tradition, they talk a lot about the importance of having that initial breakthrough moment of practice in meditation or otherwise. And there's a lot of, again, there's technical different differences between all this, but in general, we're talking about a, a kind of intuitive insight into what the Buddhists call emptiness. And the idea, and, and I kind of hesitated a moment ago about the technical difficult or the technicalities of this. In the early Buddhist tradition, so the Hinayana, the Theravada tradition, the breakthrough moment is particularly the breakthrough moment of understanding the confused nature of the self. This is what some people would call a, a, an understanding or a realization of no self, a realization of anatta or anatman. And in some Buddhist traditions, that's what constitutes stream entry, as they call it. Being a stream enterer is that initial sat saturi, that initial breakthrough moment of the realization of, oh my gosh, I'm not between the ears and behind the eyes. <laughs> In the Hinayana, it's about realization of no self. I would suggest, or I would kind of say that in the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, it's a kind of satori realization about the idea of emptiness, which is not just about the no self of, of me, it's sort of about the no self of everything. And to speak about emptiness or the no self of everything, that's where things become dream-like. So the point is, is this. So here's my cup. The idea is, is that I could tonight have a dream where I'm holding what looks like this cup. And what the Dharma suggests, especially this Mahayana Dharma that we're gonna get into tonight, what this suggests is, is that the cup that I encounter in my dream, it's the same as this one, in that this one doesn't exist either. <laughs> but is also a kind of projection of the mind in that way. Now, I, I'm going to hold off on going deep into emptiness right now, because that's what the text is about. And I go off on emptiness practically every Sunday night. So I'm going to stay focused. But I did want you to kind of appreciate that one can have, and this is part of the practice, or I, I should say it's part of the tradition, that one does have an initial breakthrough moment where there's a, a level of understanding. And for me, and I'll speak very personally now, my experience of that moment was very much like a lucid dream, <laughs> very much that same feeling in that way. But as I said, just because one becomes lucid, one may still have plenty of desire. And actually, one may see their dream, their lucid dream world, as just a place to fulfill desire. So just because we have an awakening experience doesn't necessarily mean that we've dealt with our greed or meaning our attraction or our aversion or in a, again, the kind of delusion of the subject object relationship. Lucidity or awakening doesn't necessarily get rid of all that. So that leads me to sort of my next point. The Bodhisattva path that we've been talking about for oh so many Sunday nights, this Bodhisattva path is about attaining, and I'm going to, I'll plant that seed right now. So it's about attaining what is called 
Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. Not just Bodhi, not just budding, not just awakening, but the highest, most incomparable level of Bodhi. Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. So one who has achieved or attained the level of Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi is a Buddha, a Buddha, an, an, an awakened one. And now I can kind of mention something else. So the idea here is, is that there's Bodhi. And by the way, too, in the Mahayana tradition, if one were to sort of have that breakthrough insight regarding emptiness and sort of have a, you know, again, it's just a glimpse into the empty nature of all phenomena. That's sort of what sets one off on the Bodhisattva path. In many ways, one is now a Bodhisattva if they've had that glimpse in that way. And so what I'm getting at is, is that there's a process now. Even though we've become lucid for a moment or more, or even just because we've had that sort of insight, that kind of, um, uh, what, are they, what would they call it in the psychedelic community, the breaking open of the head, I think they call it right. And so just because you've had that breaking open of the head, it, again, it doesn't mean the process is done. In many ways, it's just begun. And so there is these, or there is this process to full awakening. That's sort of what we're going to talk about or what I'm going to read from. So I'll, again, I'll hold off on that. Just one last little piece of the puzzle, though, for everybody. There's another idea or another word that's kind of in this milieu of Buddhist terms. And that's, of course, the word or the idea nirvana. I just want to point out really quickly regarding nirvana. Nirvana is, you know, as far as I understand it, in terms of the Abhidharma, meaning the, the early Buddhist philosophy, or in terms of any kind of Dharma in that way, nirvana, which means the blowing out, the extinguishing, Nirvana seems to always refer to the complete ending of attraction, aversion, and the confusion about the nature of the self. And my point is, what I've been kind of saying now repeatedly, just because one has the breakthrough moment, you might still have plenty of desire and plenty of aversion and plenty of delusion about the self. And so the process of weeding those out. And of course, let's keep in mind, from the Buddhist point of view, these three things are entirely habitual. And it's a habit, all three of them are habits that all sentient beings have, from the smallest single cell organism that moves towards what it wants to consume, what moves away from that which it deems harmful and creates a membrane around itself, delineating itself from the single-celled organism all the way to the gods. All sentient beings have the habit of desire, aversion, and the delusion that they're in there somewhere. So yeah, one sec, Tanya, I just want to mention that then the process of bringing those habits to an end, the idea is, is that they might linger around for a while. But if you could totally pss, pss, like put out those flames of those three permanently, that's called nirvana. Tanya. You know, I think you answered my question. So it's like, they just don't arise. It's not like they arise and you can see them as empty. It's just, they're, they just, they're gone. Okay. That is the idea of nirvana. It's also why, by the way, in some traditions, a Buddha is a very rare, <laughs> exalted state of being 
because greed, anger, and delusion are so hard to fully eradicate. So just want to put that out there that it's not an easy task and Buddhism doesn't really think it's an easy task in that way. But a bodhisattva, by virtue of being a bodhisattva, it is in a way bound for such a state of being. Now, the thing that I want to point out, though, is that bodhi or awakening, bodhi and awakening is very much sort of along the lines of vipassana, insight. It's about understanding, it's about awareness, it's about like clarity of thought. Whereas nirvana is about those emotions, the emotions of desire, the emotions of anger, and the emotions of self, which are many from shame and guilt to this and that. So the, those, the, what I'm getting at is that nirvana is like the ultimate shamatha. Nirvana is the ultimate state of calm, cessation, emotional equilibrium, all of that. And bodhi or awakening is like this awareness about emptiness, awareness about the, of the dreamlike nature of reality. And I'll just bracket this. Awakening is usually understood as, as an understanding of dependent origination, by the way. But all of that has to do with kind of wisdom and insight. While nirvana is over here in the kind of realm of meditation and quiescence. Now, these two, of course, are working very much together in that sense. Um, and of course, if you kind of, well, the Buddhists would use the word yoga, the union, as the union or the yoking of shamatha and vipassana, those two working together is Buddhist yoga. So part meditative, uh, part meditation and part contemplation. So, and since Bodhi is about contemplation, we're going to read a little bit of the Dharma. So, okay, um, really, really quickly, um, maybe I'll, uh, yeah, maybe next week I'll dive deeper into this, but um, a different topic, I mean. But the sutra that we're reading, that we've been reading for a while, there's two English versions of it, as everybody knows. There's a translation from Tibetan, and there's a translation from the Chinese. And I'm working on my own translation from the Chinese, because the version that we have, which is a translation from Chinese, is incomplete. So I'm working on my own to make a complete English translation. Tonight, I'm going to read from this version. By the way, this is, of course, our Treasury of Mahayana Sutras, right? And we've been reading this sutra very slowly for a while. And this sutra is called... Um, Manjushri Bodhisattva's uh, Pure Land Sutra, basically. It's a little more complicated than that, but so it's about a particular Bodhisattva named Manjushri. Um, this is Manjushri, by the way. I haven't shown a picture of Manjushri for a while. You can always recognize an image of Manjushri because of that flaming sword. That's the flaming sword of wisdom that cuts off duality. We're going to learn a little bit about that idea here in a moment. But what's funny about this sutra is, I mean, we're, we're on page, I don't even know what page, but we're pretty deep in this sutra now. This has been going on for a while. And it's only tonight that we are introduced to Manjushri. <laughs> even though this is the sutra that is all about Manjushri. But, and I'm not, I'm not going to review where we've been in the sutra just yet. Um, it'd be way too much to cover. But if you've been coming for, to Darmendors for a while, you know that this has been about a bodhisattva sort of generating this will 
or this vow to purify their Buddha land and achieve Buddhahood, to become a Buddha. And this process has been going on for a very long time in the, in the text. We've spent the last many weeks hearing the Buddha, the Buddha, tell Shariputra, a monk, all of these different ways of being a bodhisattva and ways of developing a pure land and all of that. And in many ways, all of that, pages and pages and pages and pages, are all to contextualize what we're about to read. <laughs> now, you don't have to have read all of that or been here on Sunday nights, but if you were, tonight is the night in that way. So, um, yeah, let me just get into it because it's a little dense and we don't have too long. So after everything that happened, there was a bodhisattva, another bodhisattva. This bodhisattva's name was Thunderous Voice Lion Courage. Or, I mean, it's a long Sanskrit name that has to do with a thundering voice and lion-like courage. So the thundering voice, lion-like courage bodhisattva arose from his seat, bared his right shoulder, knelt with his right knee on the ground, joined his palms facing the Buddha and said, this bodhisattva Manju Shri, the eternally youthful one, is always praised by the Buddhas. World honored one, when will he attain Anuttara Samyak Sambuddhi? What kind of Buddha land will he attain? The Buddha said, you should ask Manjushri yourself. <laughs> Thereupon, Bodhisattva, thunderous voice of lion-like courage, asked the Bodhisattva Manjushri, Venerable, when will you attain Anuttara Samyak Sambuddhi? <laughs> Manjushri answered, Instead of asking me whether I progress toward awakening, why do you ask me when I will attain awakening? Why do I ask this? Because I don't even progress towards awakening. How can I then attain it? Bodhisattva, thunderous voice of lion-like courage, asked, Manjushri, do you not progress towards awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings? Haven't you taken the Bodhisattva vow and are progressing towards awakening for the sake of all beings? Manjushri answered, no. Why not? Because sentient beings are inapprehensible. If there were sentient beings, I would progress toward awakening for all of their benefit. Since neither a sentient being, a life, or a personal identity exists in reality, I do not progress toward awakening, nor do I regress from it. All right, let me pause there. So <laughs> this whole sutra up to this point has been about the bodhisattva making this vow of attaining Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi for the benefit of all sentient beings. It's been building this up and building this up, how to do it and what it's going to look like when we get our pure land or our Buddha land and all of this. So all of this has been building up to this moment where there's this interesting dialogue. And um, yeah, really quickly, I do want to mention this. 
The reason why I'm so excited about Mahayana Buddhist sutras, especially a sutra like this, it's a perfect example of I'm I'm often describing what what I call this is just me Michael's language, but Mahayana Buddhist sutras use what I would call a trilectical argument, not a dialectical argument, which of course philosophers, in particular a philosopher like Plato, is very famous for his construction of, of dialectical arguments. And dialectical means there are two. And you usually have Socrates and somebody who thinks they know something, right? Classic Plato, right? Somebody who thinks they're so smart and Socrates. And Plato, who's just the author, records a conversation between Socrates and somebody and why it's called a dialectical argument is because you, you see the truth arrived at. That's kind of why people are excited about platonic dialogues, is it's sort of like, well, so-and-so said this, but so-and-so counters with this, but Socrates says that, but what about this? Because of that, ta-da. So you, you, there's an argument in which you see the counterpoint, but what about this? And then the response, and then the counter response, and then it culminates in this conclusion. And the idea is, is that you, the reader, have witnessed the truth arrived at. And that, from a philosophical point of view, is, is like better than just telling you the truth. <laughs> like just telling you the conclusion, we're going to show you how we got there. So Plato, Plato's cool. Dialectical arguments are cool. What I think is going on in Mahayana sutras is a trilectical argument. And we're going to see that happen in a second, but it, it actually already has happened. Where the Bodhisattva goes to the Buddha and says, hey, what's up with Manjushri? And he's like, well, why don't you go ask him yourself? And in a moment, the Buddha is going to kind of come back in as an arbiter. So we have a dialectical argument that's about to take place between Bodhisattva thundering voice and Manjushri. But then there's going to be a third element of the Buddha who comes in. So that's going to be, again, from this kind of um, philosophical point of view, it's going to be very interesting. So after this big buildup, we get the question, hey, Manjushri, when are you going to attain? When are you going to become a Buddha? How long until you attain Anuttara Samyaksambodhi? And Manjushri says this thing about how I'm not even going for awakening. So how could I attain it? And then the Bodhisattva thunderous voice steps back and says, whoa, wait a minute. Aren't you a Bodhisattva bound for Buddhahood? Isn't that the deal? And that's when Manjushri gives us our first little bit of pranya wisdom, this transcendent wisdom. And what he says is this thing about how there are no sentient beings. If there were, of course, I would progress towards awakening for their benefit. But since there's no sentient beings, no life, and no, what do they call it? Sorry personal identity. That word, by the way, a personal identity is a really important thing. It's called a pudgala, P-U-D-G-A-L-A, pudgala. So there's no sentient being, there's no life, and there's no pudgala. That's Manjushri's position. So if you have read the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra, this should sound very familiar. 
the Vajra Pranya Paramita Sutra, of course, is like the first Pranya Paramita Sutra. It probably is even the first Mahayana Buddhist Sutra. And it's in that sutra that the Buddha makes this very profound claim, which is that there's no self, individuality, sentient being, or even life. So those are the four in, that are listed in the Vajra Sutra, self, Pudgala, Sattva, and Jiva. So Atman, Pudgala, Jiva, uh, Sattva, those are these four. Only three of those are listed here, but they're going to deal with the self idea. But really quickly, let me just break this down for you. <laughs> I always say that, and I'm like, how am I going to do that? <laughs> um, here's, a, here's a way. Um, <laughs> so start with the idea that they list, which is the beginning, which is that he says there's no sentient beings exist. So let's put it to you this way. It, it starts with, and this is where the Vajra Sutra is a really good starting point for all of this. So the Vajra Sutra, it actually talks about not, not that there aren't sentient beings. It talks about the characteristics of being a sentient being the characteristic of being alive, and then the characteristic of having a personality, what's called a putgala. So the reason why I emphasize this, that the, the real Vajra wisdom, the real Pranya wisdom, it's about the characteristics of these things. So let's, let me do it this way. So, hi. Do I have the characteristics of a sentient being? Probably, right? I'm talking like a sentient being. I'm moving like a sentient being. If, if you were to say something, I'd respond to you. So that's all indications of sentience, right? <laughs> Let's say. How about, how about my little friend there? Here, is that a sentient being? It looks like a sentient being. It looks like a little bird. Is it a sentient being though? Right away, you're probably saying, no, not a sentient being. Why not? It looks like a bird. Ah, but it's not moving like a bird. I've been coming to Dharma doors now for, for years and that bird hasn't moved an inch. So, even though it has the appearance of a sentient being, it doesn't actually have all of the requisite characteristics of a sentient being. Now, of course, what's uh, uh, a hot, uh, um, a hot topic, a hot debate now is artificial intelligence, the idea of AI. And the idea is, is, well, what happens when there's a robot that moves like a person and talks like a person and responds like a person, are we going to call them a sentient being or not? So what I'm emphasizing is, is that at this point, you know, and I haven't met all these robots, so I don't know, maybe there's a robot out there, but the robots I've seen they don't pass the characteristic test. <laughs> M meaning they don't have, to me, to my eyes, they don't have the characteristics of a sentient being. Again, at least the ones that I've seen or the ones that I've met. And so I don't deem them to be sentient, just like I don't deem that bird to be sentient, but I deem all of you to be sentient. So, what I'm setting up here is the criteria by which we 
say something is sentient or not. And what the why we would do that, how we would do that is based upon the characteristics. So I set this up and actually let me let me cram all these together, by the way. So the other one Manjushri mentions is about jiva, life, something being alive or not. Is, is the little bird alive? We would say no. Again, it doesn't have the characteristic of life, right? And the same thing is going on with my robot. It's like, is it alive? Well, it doesn't have the characteristics of life yet in that way. But as soon as we think it does have the characteristics of life and sentience, we would probably deem it a sentient being in that way. So th the idea here is, and then, oh, let me mention that third one, then I can really wrap all these up together. So this third one is an interesting idea. It's called a pudgala. I would, I normally translate this word as personality. And it's an interesting idea within the world of Buddhism that it's a way of sort of talking about, let's say, Michael or Michaelness, while not asserting there being an essential Michael. Meaning, it's a, a Pudgala is a Buddhist idea for the Michaelness without the Atman or the soul or the essence of Michael. So it accounts for or describes a personality that is seemingly continuous over time. My point is, is that a, a good Buddhist, a good Buddhist recognizes that their physical body of form is not the same physical body of form they had 10 years ago, 20 years ago, or what have you. A good Buddhist is very cognizant that this is not the same body of form from before. But some early schools of Buddhism argued that there was a Pudgala, which was like the habit energy of Michaelness that continued over time. And so we could kind of still talk about Michael without asserting there being an essential Michael. And that's what the early Buddhists called a pudgala, a personality. And I want to tell you that actually one of the early Hinayana schools, and remember, there were many Hinayana schools. There were many small vehicle schools. And one of the early small vehicle Buddhist schools were called the Pudgala Vadans. And it's because they asserted the existence of a Pudgala. It's one of the reasons why Manjushri is saying no Pudgala. <laughs> that a personality is also going to be characteristic based. That I have the characteristics of this Michael Pudgala. Okay, Manjushri tells us though, no sentient being, no life, no Pudgala. How can that be, Manjushri? Should I tell you? <laughs> yeah, well, let me, yeah, let me tell you really quickly how that is, and then we'll read about it. So in terms of the characteristics of being a sentient being or not, in terms of the characteristics of being alive or not, in terms of there being personality characteristics or not, let's think about characteristics now for a second. One of my favorite characteristics to talk about is how tall I am. And the idea is, is am I a tall, big person? 
like for real, like, am I tall? Am I big? Am I big guy? And I use this example often because you, you, you might have, think like maybe you might think I'm skinny or might maybe think I'm big or tall. I don't know what you, I don't know what you think in that way. But the point is, is that I often refer to how if you think I'm tall, what happens when I go into a room full of basketball players? All of a sudden, I'm not so tall anymore. But then if I go back into a different room where everybody's down here, I'm, all of a sudden I'm tall again. And it's almost as if I'm neither short nor tall inherently. But depending upon what I'm standing next to, I could be perceived as short or tall. But Wisdom, prana wisdom, understands that this is neither big nor small. It's neither tall nor short. But the mind, even, even my mind, can get enveloped into a deluded sense that that characteristic is here, not in the mind of the perceiver, but actually a, a quality of this. Now, the way I put that was, I said, depending on what I was standing next to, you might think I'm tall or short. Well, depending on what I'm standing next to, you might think I'm a sentient being that's alive with a personality. Because of what isn't alive, what doesn't have sentience, and what isn't a personality by which I'm pointing to the little bird here that doesn't have those things. Now, again, you probably just think that I'm alive and that's not alive. But what Manjushri is talking about is how the, the actual quality or characteristic of being a living thing is equally dependently originated upon the idea of a non-living thing. And those two things mutually create each other. And it's a delusion to think that the quality of life is in something. But don't we think we're alive? And don't we think certain things are not alive? What we would call inanimate. The prana wisdom is about understanding that even characteristics like being alive are not inherently owned by a creature in that way. And of course, it only takes a very brief moment of inquiry to realize that the characteristic or quality that we call life is undefined. There are opinions about when things are alive and when things are not. There's opinions about what constitutes life and what doesn't. But I'm here to tell you that the jury is still out in terms of what exactly constitutes life. And the biggest, the biggest problem or one of the biggest problems with defining life is that fire always manages to find its way back into being defined as being alive because it moves, it requires and like a source of energy, it breathes, it needs oxygen, it has all of the characteristics required, it, it reproduces itself, it has all the characteristics and qualities of life, but are we ready to call a fire alive. And we aren't. And that's where we run into problems with defining life. Crystals. Crystals also often sneak into being defined as being alive, even though they should be in the mineral world. The reason why I'm telling you all of this is just to point at how we think the characteristic of life is very clearly defined, and we think it's a quality of things. 
Pranya wisdom recognizes that the quality, the characteristic of life is undefined. And even if we were to find the definition, it would still be foolish to attribute it to being a quality of something. But we do it nonetheless in that way. Everybody want to find out a little bit more about how this could be. Cool. So that's Manjushri's answer for why he's not even trying to become awakened in that way, let alone attain it, is because there isn't even any sentient beings, life, or Pudgala. So then our Bodhisattva thunderous voice says again, but Manjushri, don't you progress towards Buddha Dharma? It's a kind of a complicated phrase, but it's still kind of referring to Buddhahood in that sense. So still kind of asking the question, but aren't you like still bound for Buddhahood in some way? Manjushri answers, well, no. And why? He says, because all phenomena, all dharmas progress towards Buddhahood. Why? because they are all devoid of defilement, all devoid of bondage, all devoid of shape and form. As the Buddha abides in such suchness, so do all dharmas. He says to the Bodhisattva, Manjushri says to the Bodhisattva, you asked me whether I progress towards Buddhahood, whether I progress, progress towards all Buddha Dharma. Now I'm going to ask you some questions. Answer as you like. What do you think? Does physical form, Rupa, does Rupa seek awakening? How about the essential nature, the svabhava of rupa, of physical form? Perhaps the thusness of form, the self-beingness of form, the emptiness of form, the total absence of form, or the very dharmic nature of the concept of form. Do those seek awakening? <laughs> what do you think? Does form, the essential nature of form, the thusness of form, the self-beingness of form, the emptiness of form, the absence of form, or the very dharmic nature of the concept of form, do any of those attain awakening? So before I read the Bodhisattva's answer to this question, which I hope you already know the answer to this question, by the way. So what Manjushri is basically saying, and let me just kind of summarize and uh, kind of look ahead a little bit. When he's talking about form or rupa, he is, of course, talking about the physical body. And what he's about to talk about in the next paragraph is about sensations, perception, conditioning, and consciousness, which are, of course, the five skandhas, the five aggregates. This is, of course, the classic early Buddhist teaching about the nature of any sentient subject. Again, it doesn't matter whether it's a, a cat, it doesn't matter if it's a human. What makes a sentient being, a sentient being, according to early Buddhism, or what makes this, this, and not you, is that this is this body of form. You 
are that body of form by which we're talking about those particular eyes, those particular ears, nose, tongue, and body, internal organs, everything including the, the mind, the brain. And what makes a cat a cat is that it's that body of form <laughs> with those bodily organs, those ears, that little nose that can smell so well, it's that body of form. So form, sensations, and the point is, is that what you are, are these sensations that you're having right now, hearing the sound of my voice, responding to the sound of my voice, the temperature in the room, responding to the temperature in the room, all of the sensations of that body of form. Whereas this are all the sensations of this body of form. And from this body of form, which is currently presently having these bodily sensations, there is this perception arising. Form, sensations, perception. You are that body of form having those sensations and therefore perceiving what you're perceiving. I'm over here perceiving what I'm perceiving in that sense. Form, sensation, perception conditioning, samskara, the habits. This is these habits. You're those habits. <laughs> I'm not your habits. You're not my habits. I'm this body of form. You're that body of form. And so what makes this this? And when I say this, I'm talking about what you're looking at right now, what this is happening. Not a Michael but I'm talking about this, which is this body of form, these present sensations, what I'm perceiving, and then my habits, these habits versus your habits. And then, of course, from this body of form, from these sensations, from what I'm perceiving, based upon my conditioned habits, there is this consciousness arising. And this is not your consciousness. This is this consciousness. So those are the five aggregates, form sensations, perception, conditioning, and consciousness. And the most important thing I can tell you from the like overall Buddhist point of view, like any school of Buddhism, the point is, is that all five of those are constantly changing. There is no static being. There is an experience, an ever-evolving, ever-changing experience based upon those five aggregates in that way. But the, again, the most important point from a Buddhist point of view is that they're, they're never the same five. So you can never put your finger on what would be considered the essential part to be Michael in that sense. So... That's classic Buddhism, the five aggregates. And what Manjushri is doing here is he's saying to the Bodhisattva, so is it form that seeks awakening? That would be like asking a modern scientist, is it the atoms that are seeking awakening? Is it my finger? Is it the, the physical body that is seeking awakening? Is it the physical body that is, sorry, that attains awakening? And Manjushri goes even further because of course he's not messing around. So he doesn't just ask the Bodhisattva, is it physical form that seeks awakening? He cuts him off at the pass and says, okay, how about the essential nature of form of which there is no svabhava or essential nature of form. So that can't seek awakening. How about the thusness or the emptiness? Like all of these really profound dharmic ideas about the very nature of form. Do those seek awakening? The Bodhisattva says, no, Manjushri. 
form doesn't seek awakening, nor does the basic essential nature of form, the thusness of form, the self beingness of form, the emptiness of form, the absence of form, or the very dharmic nature of the concept of form. None of those seek awakening. Form doesn't attain awakening, nor does the basic nature of form, the thusness of form, the self-entity of form, the emptiness, the absence of form, or the very dharmic nature of the concept of form. Manjushri asks again, what do you think? Do sensations, perceptions, your habits, your conditioning, or consciousness? Do any of those, including the essential nature of sensation and perception, conditioning, and consciousness, the emptiness of all of those, the thusness of all of those, all the way down to the very dharmic nature of the concept of consciousness, do any of those seek or attain awakening? And the Bodhisattva says, no, Manjushri, none of those seek awakening and none of those attain awakening. Manjushri asked, so what do you think? Is there an I or a mine apart from those five aggregates? And the Bodhisattva answered, no. That is, of course, the Dharma, that there is not a self that is in addition to the five aggregates. That is the teaching of no self, that there's no leader. There's no head to the five aggregates. So Manjushri asks, and so if none of the five aggregates or the essential nature of the five aggregates or the emptiness or thusness or any of that of the five aggregates, if none of those seek or attain awakening and there's no self and there's no mind, he says, what else could seek an awakening? then what else can seek and attain awakening? The Bodhisattva, ver, uh, thunderous voice of lion-like courage. He says, Manjushri, venerable, your words are sincerely believed by the people, but now you're saying not to seek awakening, not to attain awakening. Bodhisattvas who have just made their vow for awakening will certainly be frightened by such statements. And Manjushri said, Bodhisattva, there is nothing to be feared, nor is there fear in reality. It is for those who have fear that the Buddha teaches the Dharma. However, those who fear things will have disgust for them. And those who have disgust for things will renounce their desire for them. Those who renounce desire for things will become liberated. Those who are liberated don't need awakening. Those who don't need awakening will not abide in anything. Those who do not abide in anything will not go. Those who do not go do not come. Those who do not come will have no wishes. Those who have no wishes will not regress. Those who do not regress will regress. What will they regress from? They will regress from attachment to a self. They will regress from attachment to sentient beings. They will regress from attachment to life, attachment to pudgala, personal identity, attachment to nihilism, attachment to eternalism, attachment to appearances, 
and attachment from discrimination. Those who regress from these will not regress. From what will they not regress? They will not regress from emptiness, signlessness, and wishlessness. Nor will they regress from the Buddha Dharma. What is the Buddha Dharma? It is neither detachment nor attachment. It grasps no object, enters nowhere, emerges from nowhere, practices nothing, and defies expression. It is a name only, empty, non-arising. It neither goes nor comes. It is neither defiled nor pure. It is beyond stain and stainlessness. It is egoless and non-discriminating. It is not composite, nor is it clinging. It is equality and non-contradiction. All right. I'm going to pause, end it there. Ah, we were just getting going, but it's just too good. and I don't want to rush it. So that just gives us a taste of where this is going. But hopefully we got a slight glimpse at Bodhi or awakening as Manjushri would define it. Manjushri is defining this with that that razor's edge of wisdom that is cutting in between all dualities, even these most precious dualities of Buddhism, which by which I mean the idea of relinquishment, the idea of letting go. In the early Buddhist, in the Hinayana tradition, it was all about letting go, relinquishment. Don't, don't, grab, don't grasp, relinquish. And Manjushri is, again, he's articulating a level of wisdom that is between and beyond the ideas of both attachment and letting go. And you could just sit with that one for a long time of where, what is that? Meaning where or what does it mean to be in between letting go or grasping? <laughs> that non-dual state is what Manjushri is going to continue <laughs> to articulate about next week. So, uh, so that's going to conclude that. Thanks, everybody. I hope that was enlightening to some degree. Oh, thank you very much. Um, cool. That's it for me. Um, by the way, really quickly, I will mention, because I know Tanya is going to ask me if I, <laughs> I had any announcements. Um, I mentioned the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra a few times tonight. So I just want to let everybody know that next month I'm going to do, or I'm going to start an eight-week course on the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra. Saturday morning, starting July 9th, going into August at California time from 9 to 10, 15 a.m. And you can go to my website, lotusunderground.com, if you're interested in the course or want to know more about it. Thanks, everybody, so much for being here and your attention and your just your support.